Hi, I'm Erin Lee Carr, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I thought only lunatics wore backwards baseball hats, and it turns out I am correct. So I'm coming to you from some sort of secret location, and in thinking about sort of like what I could talk about for this year's South By, it really was, you know, what is the advice and the things that I've gotten from taking in all the information that the internet has to offer the last couple of years, and I was doing my research and my homework, as all documentary filmmakers do, and I noticed that a lot of commencement speeches or anything like that, they always start with a alcohol-related parable or something like that. So I will say that in 2013, my first ever South By, I, like many, really went hard on the alcohol component uh, of the sort of festivities. And it's, uh, it's less of a funny thing and more of a like, ooh, I had my badge and I couldn't go to the talks that I wanted to go to because I was too sick to do so. And I remember making a pact with myself saying, you know, if I ever get the opportunity to do this again, I'm gonna soak up all of the knowledge and I'm gonna be sober when I go back. I was able to, in 2017, premiere a film called Mommy Dead and Dearest at South By, which was, you know, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. And I was able to do it sober, but I also went to all the talks and I brought my notebook and I sort of, you know, I realized that you can really learn life lessons from people and you can actually put it inside your life. And so that's what I want to sort of share with you and do today. Recently, I was watching a very beautiful show called I May Destroy You. I looked up the actor and the writer and the EP whose name is Michaela Cole, and I just sort of wanted to know more about her and sort of what her process was. And I came across a quote, which I'll read to you guys. It says, you're always on fragile ground because it's not yours. It gives you a drive and ambition because nothing is certain. There is a resilience no person with stability can replicate. You can't forge it. There are blessings in the struggle. It's taped here to my wall. There's this trend towards radical vulnerability. You can say things like you can start a professional talk saying that you had sort of like at one point alcohol issues and it doesn't have to be this thing that defines you. Michaela Cole is a black woman, which I am not. And so there are parts of her struggle, which I can never know. But I think that there is lessons to be learned in that you can grow, you can learn, you can do all sorts of things when it comes to, you know, seeing your struggle as a power. Also that she made great art out of that. And I think that, you know, Michaela Cole is at this level. We can't all do that, right? Uh, But I think that when she, I May Destroy You for those who haven't seen it, is about a young woman's perspective on being assaulted. And it's not just the night of, because I think throughout cinema, it's really been about that, but it's all the days that follow. And what is it like to have that very sensory, scary experience of remembering? And this is not like just a dark show. It's incredibly comedic and funny and quick. And, you know, I think that for her to show that being assaulted was one of the worst moments of her life, but also that she could share that with millions of people through a platform like HBO, it was really meaningful because it showed that at once it's a life altering event, but that it doesn't change you and that you can sort of grow from it. And if it does change you, it's that's okay. It's just something that really, really struck, uh, struck me and I wanted to think about and obviously like tape to the wall. Okay, so the second one, and I'm gonna name drop here, but it is my father, so please feel free to sort of eye roll. My dad was a journalist for the New York Times. He is no longer here. Uh, His name is David Carr. He was one of the biggest fans of South By, you could imagine. And he loved giving talks. He loved listening to talks. I've been to a lot of South By's. He always asked me, you know, which ones, which talks I was going to, what I've been listening to. Uh, Always like, you know, when you sort of figure out your schedule and like what you're gonna be doing and things like that. And I remember after he died, I watched a YouTube video. There was this beautiful commencement speech he did at Berkeley School of Journalism. And he said, if you're the kind of person who can be both scared and courageous at the same time, you'll probably do great things. He was talking to a group of 
people that just graduated J school, which is a very scary place. Like journalism as an industry has really hit a lot of sort of rough places. I always thought that, you know, being scared and being courageous were in opposition to one another, that they could not live inside the same Venn diagram. But what I've realized is that's not true. I think back to my own personal experience and there have been so many times where I have been scared and tried to be brave at the same time. I make uh, true crime and survivorship films for a living. And my first film was about this guy named Gil Valley who was convicted of conspiring to kidnap, rape, torture, and eat young women. I'm gonna underline the word conspiracy because that's really what it was. That's what he was actually found guilty of versus actually killing somebody and eating them. I went and visited him in a prison. And I got a small development deal from HBO to make a film about this, to see was he actually ever going to kill anybody or not. Part of the instructions for when you go to a prison is that you can't have any piercings in your face. And at the time I had a eyebrow piercing. I'm pretty punk if you like can't tell. Uh, you know, I had an eyebrow piercing and I had to remove it lest someone decide to rip it out of my face. And I just kind of thought in the car and I said, is this the right thing? Is this where I should be really like putting myself? And I didn't feel, I want to be clear, I didn't feel scared about him. Like I didn't think that he was going to trespass on me physically, but I think it was all this sort of this lead up to the prison. And I remember feeling really scared. And the second I stepped foot inside the prison, the fear did not disappear, right? Like in the story, it's always like, I got there and I did it and I was brave. And I think that um, it's important for me as a professional to say that, you know, one, it's okay to listen to safety cues. I'm in no way saying that you should not listen to cues about safety, but two, that these two things can be uh, with each other versus in conflict of. And I think, you know, there's just there's a lot of great sort of anecdotes in that speech. So I, you know, I encourage everybody to go see that. And so I was at South Bend in 2017. I got to go back in 2018. And there was this filmmaker named Barry Jenkins who was giving the film keynote. He made a film called Moonlight, which is one of the, you know, the great works of cinema of our time. And I got there, I got early. I again brought the notebook that I keep bringing up. And I started to write down notes. And one of the things that he said that I loved was, if you're under the age of 30, you should want it right now. You shouldn't expect anyone to give it to you, but you should want it right damn now. Of course you want it, right? People who are in the arts always have to want it. But I think what I'm listening to is it's not just enough to want it, you have to do it. And there's all of these things that, you know, Barry sort of talked about in his speech, I mean, that he had to drop out of film school, that he had to reorient what his life was gonna be about, what was the subject matter that he was going to, to make movies about. I just remember feeling his vulnerability and sharing his story, but that it wasn't a, it wasn't a straight up, like sort of, you know, ascent, that there were, there were peaks and there were valleys and it's okay to have failures. You don't just like, you know, win an Academy Award one day when you get up. I mean, there were so many days that sort of led up to that. And I thought his speech was so beautiful. And also he read the acceptance speech that he was supposed to read at the Academy Awards uh, before there was that incredibly weird snafu where they, they mentioned La La Land instead. If he could get through that and act gracefully, like we can all like get through it and do it. There's so much to, to learn inside that speech and it's on YouTube and uh, let's, you know, you should go do it right now. Don't stop the talk, but like, you know, do it after, right? You can't do a talk about advice without mentioning David Foster Wallace. And David Foster Wallace, for those who don't know, is uh, an American writer. He is no longer with us. He was somebody that wrote a book called Infinite Jest amongst many other books. And he became this sort of, product of the intellectual elite. Like every guy I dated in Brooklyn always prominently featured Infinite Jest. And I was just like, you know, I also skimmed Infinite Jest, but I was like, did you really read this? What's going on? But David Foster Wallace, um, while, you know, can write and pen thousands and thousands of pages, he also was an incredible thinker and speaker. And he gave this talk at Kenyon College. It's a speech called This Is Water. And it's really about sort of the tyranny of self and what does it mean? 
And the quote that I, one of the quotes that I loved was, the real world makes money off your own self-interest, off automatic ways of thinking, of considering ourselves to be the center of the universe. But this is not true freedom. We are prisoners in our own self-interest. I think that is very relatable for those in the pandemic. I think that, you know, since we have all started to, you know, be in our sort of little boxes, we all operate as if we are, you know, the lead character Truman in the Truman Show. And I am somebody that has really struggled for many years with the tyranny of self and that it really, you know, always thinking that I am sort of the center of the universe. And what this speech reminded me of was I'm a small speck of sand that is amongst thousands and millions of other specks of sand. While I, I do feel motivated to leave my mark on this like this short life that we have, I think it's important to know that we are, we are always surrounded by others. And then when we're in the checkout line or when we're at school or when we're you know trying to you know get into the Zoom room and it's not working, it's like boiling down the nervousness and the anxiety and trying to reflect on what is important about this day, about this moment. I think it really has a lot to do with social media and I'm not sort of technophobic. I am completely addicted to social media, but I think that one of the things that I learned that in order to have complex artistic thought, I really have to put down my phone. When I'm in a screening session, like I was in one today, hi Jason, uh, you know, I think that it's about putting on do not disturb and being connected to that person and saying, you know, you did a lot of work and I'm here to listen for it. David Foster Wallace has a lot to teach us about uh, what it what freedom means and how we can sort of enact that in our daily lives. When I was getting ready for this talk, I got on YouTube and I typed in commencement speech and it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I numbered that wrongly, but you know what I'm doing. 11, 12, 13, and then the 14th person was Beyonce and was finally a woman. While I struggle with that men are often selected to be these thought leaders. I thought it was so right that it was Beyonce because Beyonce is somebody that is a true artist of our time and a trendsetter, but also she is somebody that believes in bringing up other people. And you can see, I'm about to read a quote that, you know, it's not just about her, but about others. And her quote is, the entertainment business is still very sexist. It's still very male dominated. And as a woman, I did not see enough female role models given the opportunity to do what I knew I had to do, to run my label and management company, to direct my films and produce my tours. That meant ownership. And so not only is it about Beyonce, but it's about hiring other women to be brought up. And that's something that I want to carry with me as I you know, continue to work in a creative field, yes, I wanna look at how I can do this for the rest of my life, but how can I encourage and be a part of others and bring other people along with me? I literally got into documentary filmmaking because I saw women in positions of power doing it. And I did not see the same thing with narrative. I saw people like Lena Dunham on Girls, but it was almost as if that was the exception to the rule versus the actual rule. And I did not want to wait 20 years before I was making any sort of like solid creative decision. And so while one, that's like very entitled thinking and strategic, so like go young, uh, young me, it's also kind of sad, right? I think that me to notice as a young person the sexism that is so prevalent and for me to make a life decision based on that and i you know i really in my sort of online presence i try to talk about sexism but it's almost as if i really sort of begin to tweet about it and then it's like well well people think i'm hard to work with and so often when people say things out loud that are unpopular or are not even that's like a very like i think now populist sort of thought but it really does take people like Beyonce and all the people I mentioned to say these things for it to become sort of more normalized. And so, you know, in large credit to her. It's very hard to follow Beyonce, so we're not going to. I'm gonna go into the worst advice and I feel like a little bad. I think it was really easy for me to find all of the good advice and I had so many people to sort of pick from, but I really struggled with the bad advice because I don't want to call people out and like, there is some bad advice on the internet, um, but I felt weird putting their names in there because like, you know, I need to eat and my dog needs to eat. And so, you know, I don't think he'll mind, but I remember coming across this William Shatner quote that says, 
don't be afraid to make an ass out of yourself. And I just said, hmm, well, I don't think that that is totally advice I would give. And I think, you know, honestly, it comes from a place of being an actor and getting to make an ass out of yourself. Uh, that's like, it's kind of more accepted. But two, it comes from, again, from a place of privilege. We now live in the internet. And if you do anything or say anything, it can follow you around. Don't be censoring yourself about what you're saying. Still talk about sexism or your experience or your struggle, but also be thoughtful about how you contextualize that struggle and how you um, you know, how you message these things because it is semi-permanent. Other advice I got was don't pay back your student loans. They said, you know, put money towards retirement, put money towards a trip, or like literally just having rent. You know, I obviously, like many young people, didn't have a lot of money to spare. And so I just paid the minimum. And then a couple of years ago, I finally met with someone who works in finance and she said, yeah, you should pay off your loans. <laughs> then she started to explain two words to me that I hadn't heard before, compound interest. And I think at this point in the talk, you might be like, this lady is a straight up dummy. She does not know how compound interest rates work, even though she took out loans for an education. But I think that I totally sort of subscribed to the American dream and it didn't matter how much money an education costs because I would have my whole life to sort of pay it back. Had I gotten the advice earlier, I don't know if I would have been able to take it because I did not have money to, to spare, but I really would have, you know, basically designed my financial life a little bit differently knowing that this is sort of my responsibility and the longer you go without paying it, you're just, your interest rates are gonna sort of eat you alive. I think it's funny that this is like covered so many different things, David Foster Wallace, interest loans, Beyonce, welcome to my skull. To talk about one of the last things that changed my life, I got feedback when I was in my mid twenties, when I was considering leaving my job from a colleague that said, you should stay at your job. You should not leave. You need health insurance. Don't do that. Be careful. And I remember, you know, sort of sitting with that that night and thinking, okay, well, maybe I should rethink this. Like, you know, I shouldn't sort of go out and take that leap of faith. And I ended up leaving that media company for another one. And then, you know, really working now finally up to when I was 25 to being a documentary filmmaker, which is code for hangs out in apartment a lot. I almost let this person talk me out of something that I really wanted to do. And so that's, you know, that's where we really have to understand that advice is just that. It's advice coming from another person. And had I listened to that, I would have been in a very different spot in my life. And I think that sometimes, you know, as we're sitting here, you do have to take that leap of faith and it is not always going to pay off. There are gonna be those detours or those sort of those valleys and I'm not saying like you should quit your day job because I think that you can do things as a person at night if you need to. I remember in that sort of that time in 2017 when I was able to come back to South by and I premiered Mommy Dead and Dearest and I was sitting at the Alamo and the lights were going uh, you know, off and everyone was sort of like in their seats. And there was this guy next to me that was like starting to sort of you know, chomp on a giant pizza. And I was like, is this guy about to eat a entire pizza while they watch my cinema? And I like started to get like sort of frazzled and then I caught myself and I said, this is what the leap of faith led to. That you have a film that somebody paid money for a ticket to come see and that this is a privilege. And it's sometimes about living in that moment and you know, not letting all of the sort of the, the nervousness or the anxiety or what went wrong or, uh, you know, that the dude is next to you, but just existing in the moment of this is perfect and there is something so beautiful about this. I have been able to have many of that moments because I've seen others do it and I've watched others do it and I've watched others sort of act with grace as they give their talk or they give that, you know, that student that reaches out to them advice and I think that it's really about sort of paying it forward. So that's all to say, please go on YouTube or uh, please go see all the other talks because you never know. You never know when you're gonna hear that piece of advice that changes your life. Really a big thank you to Janet and to all and every member of her team who makes South By happen 
it is really, really hard to pull off, specifically the last couple of years in particular. And so the fact that they continue to be a place that can champion work and that for others to see, it's incredible and it's so appreciated. And I want to learn a lot more from all the movies. So I think that's it. And yeah.